you. <laughs> you can still leave if you're bored. I wanted to give you a brief introduction um, to, to tonight's talk. Um, the talk actually came about, um, well, it took as a starting point Paul Shepard's recent book, um, Buildings Between Living Time and Rocky Space. And um, that book actually launched here with a lecture by Paul um, in term one. And um, I think Will, after reading this book, I wanted to kind of interrogate Paul and probe further into um, the relationship between writing and building and they've asked Chumi to moderate this discussion. So to give you a short introduction to each of them, um, Paul Shepard is a writer living in London. He's qualified as an architect, but since the publication of What is Architecture by MIT Press in 1994, he gradually shifted the emphasis of his activities to writing and lecturing. He has two other books with MIT Press, The Cultivated Wilderness about landscape um, and Artificial Love about architecture and machines. Um, how to Like Everything, A Utopia, was published by Zero Books in July 2013. And um, the book that we're going to talk about tonight, Buildings Between Living Time and Rocky Space, was published by Circa Press in October 2016. Um, he's taught at the Architectural Association in London, the University of Texas in Austin, and the Academy van Baukunst in Amsterdam. Um, also, just to mention, you can buy the book uh, later this evening, should you want to. Um, then uh, Will Alsop, who's also joining us tonight, is a prominent architect and artist who established All Design in 2011. He was awarded the Sterling Prize for Peckham Library and the first Reba World Award for the Sharp Center for Design in Toronto. Um, his core values are innovation and expression with an emphasis on enjoyment. And his practice is founded principally to make life better. He sits on architectural advisory boards for Wandsworth and Kensington and Chelsea Councils and is the professor at TU Vienna and um, professor of architecture at Canterbury School of Architecture. And finally, Shumi um, Bose is a teacher, curator and editor based in London. She's a senior lecturer in contextual studies for BA Architecture at Central St. Martins and teaches history and theory studies at the AA. Um, in 2016, she co-founded Real Review, a publication about architecture geared at a general readership, and she regularly contributes to architectural books and magazines. Um, with Finn Williams and Jack Self, she co-curated Homo Economics, which was the British Pavilion at the last Venice Architecture Biennale. And um, she was a curatorial collaborator with David Chipperfield for Common Ground, which was the 13th Venice Biennale. And so without any further ado, I will hand it over to the three of them. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming um, Paul, Will, and Jimmy. <laughs> Uh, Nani Jo, and especially thanks to you guys for being here today. I know it's um, very crunch time in term, so if there are any students in the audience, particularly thanks to you for, uh, for making the time. Um, and thank you to you too for inviting me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be sitting talking to you. Um, the, the event is billed as a conversation with, so I hope you don't mind that it'll be fairly informal in the sense that I have questions to ask both of, both of these gentlemen. I'm sure they have questions for each other. But um, it's a conversation with you two. So I hope that rather than kind of having a sort of set piece between the three of us and then opening out to you, that you please feel free to stick your hand up and, and um, join in at any point. Disagree with us, please. I mean, there's, I mean, a conversation without any kind of tension is a bit boring. So um, please get involved as soon as you'd like. Um, so as Manuja said, um, we're here principally on the occasion of this book, which is a lovely book, and it's, uh, it's at the back there, and I urge you to, to check it out and take it home with you and spend some time with it, as we've both done. Um, and, well, let me come to it slightly personally. Uh, I'm not an architect, and I'm only, let's say, what, 12, 13 years into my working life, and I'm still not quite uh, completely shed of of that feeling of saying I'm not an architect, but I write about architecture, I talk about architecture, kind of feeling whether I, uh, I really have a right to do so. And in fact, it was coming across Paul's writing I found incredibly reassuring. Um, I think my first book of yours was How to Like Everything. Um, and then I went backwards and, and found a kind of writing about architecture that was um, very much not what I'd encountered as a, as a budding journalist, where you're, um, let's say, some kind of medium between the construction industry and the architect, and your job is um, 
quite narrow, there's a sort of transactional basis. Will, I hope you can um, maybe throw in some of your experiences about this later on. Whereas I think Paul's writing felt to me very much about the experience and contemplation of the act of producing architecture. Um, and so as a non-architect, as a non-designer, I found this um, a really warm, encouraging way in where I didn't have to feel um, you know, less, let's say, for, for not understanding certain technical elements and so on. Um, so there's a little passage I'd like to read to you um, from the book, and I promise it's only four or five sentences, um, and I'll do that in just a moment. In terms of bringing together these two, um, well, it was interesting in, in Manage's uh, introduction, how to like everything on the one hand and how to make life better on the other hand. Um, recently, it's come to our attention as teachers of architecture, particularly teachers of um, yeah, young undergraduates, that conversations about architectural discourse can be a little bit depressing at the moment, particularly thinking about things like the housing crisis or things like um, land, uh, land use policy in the UK. Um, we seem to be in somewhat of a malaise, particularly regarding architectural agency. Um, and again, finding two people who want to talk about making life better and liking everything, I hope perhaps we can um, lighten this discourse somewhat and, and come to something slightly more productive. So let me um, just come to this little paragraph that I'd like to read out. <coughs> Thanks for indulging me with that. Um, so this is, I think, from the first chapter of the book. It's that one. It seemed to me that the original field of Rome that Romulus built his ditch around had grown into a continuous surface of huge, profound buildings, a rumpled bed as eventful as the surface of the moon. In the French cathedrals, I'd discovered the adjacency of buildings to the sky, and now here in Rome, it was the adjacency to the ground they stand on. Perhaps if landscape and machines on the X, are on the X axis of architecture, I now conclude sky and ground are on the Y. It's a deep matter, but not a complicated one. Like objects and their relationships, or like meaning and interpretation, or like creation and evolution. And although buildings are central to all this, they are at the same time simply themselves. That's all good, isn't it? It is good, isn't it? You wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you perhaps start us off by um, saying how you went from being a bona fide qualified architect to then moving more into writing? Oh, God. It's... Um... I have to expose myself in order to answer this question. Because when you're a school of architecture, you talk about architecture and you study architecture and you think about architecture a lot. And you know all there is to be known about architecture by the time you leave. Except you don't know about clients, you don't know about money, you don't know about the law. And most of all, you don't know about the, the unimpeachable demands that materials make on each other. Like the simplicity of a saw cut is absolutely final. So with all the, all the talking and the writing and stuff like that the, that I was doing as a student, I guess we weren't all doing this, but I was, I graduated and s started working as an architect straight away, as we all did, yeah? And I went to work with Roger Schofield, you remember him, and Nick Norden and Mike DeMarco. And I'm sorry, I'm just thinking of us, uh, this 50 years on, and we're all wrecks now, but um, we were all eager young men then. And we started off, and I discovered I just didn't know a thing. And I had to talk to a plumber about something I didn't know what he was talking about. And I had to, it was given to me to meet the scaffolders one morning. <laughs> These scaffolders are the roughest guys in the building trade, you know, they turn up and they're completely direct. How do you want this to be? And I just didn't have a clue. And it, right at that early stage, it dawned on me, I might not be cut out for this. <laughs> <laughs> but I found a, a way of surviving by teaching and doing, going to work for other people mm. who took the brunt of that. And I, when I was working, I became a, a, a writer of scheme reports for National Health Service hospitals, meeting... Uh, um, client committees and writing up things and um, I got quite good at that but it wasn't architecture and it was very boring and so I 
didn't know what to do next, but I got a job at Kingston teaching with um, Hilary French, Jeremy Till, Duncan and Graham Modlin. We were teaching second year. It was, it was cold face teaching. And uh, it was very, very difficult to do. I was the oldest of the bunch. Everybody else was 32, you know, and I was 45. And I was the oldest of the bunch. And uh, I was just furious with this job. I was furious at having to do it. when I didn't know. I was having a midlife crisis, obviously. I told you it was going to be personal. It doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> and um, there was one guy there, Ken Taylor, who was spouting Wittgenstein the whole time. And it just used to enrage me, this, this, this literary philosophical talk about architecture. And we used to have reviews where I would just get, I would be like a baby in a pram. I'd just be furious with what was being said because it, what did this have to do with architecture? Architecture is about material and things standing in the world, not about meaning and all this. Can we show any solidarity? Has anyone had the same feeling about discussions about architecture as to why it's all... Come on. Well, I'm not going to go on forever. <laughs> There's only two more sentences to this story. Well, I've had that feeling, Paul. So I used to yell at Ken and tell him we didn't want to hear what the fuck he had to say about architecture. This is in the review in front of students. It was embarrassing. So I decided to write it all down. What is architecture? I decided to write it down. And uh, Bob Evans showed it to MIT and they printed it and my life completely changed after that. Okay. Well, I like this quite... When you asked. No, I did. I, I like this kind of quite unromantic beginning with scaffolding and NHS building reports to the poetic prose that you managed to turn out now. So you were at school together? This school, I mean. I thought he was two years ahead of me, but it turned out to be one. One year. One year. Felt Pierce, like two. Pierce was two years ahead. Okay. I was one year ahead. And so were you friends while you were here? Uh, we, we became friends. And actually, I think probably after we both left, we used to see a lot of each other. I haven't seen him for a long time, actually. I don't know why. And it's stupid. But anyway, here we are. But uh, at the beginning of this book, that's what I want to say. Now, I want to pick up on the, the experience of working for an architect and not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because... <clears throat> How did you survive? The first person I worked for um, after leaving this place was Cedric, Cedric Price. He didn't know anything either. <laughs> <laughs> but he did have some great people around him who did, so uh -huh. that, that, was, that was good. No, but uh, I want to go back, in the beginning of the book, it starts off with a, basically a road trip. I think before you came, just the year before it you, was, you, yeah, you started before here, started. and you had... Um, a grey minivan with a big sort of American decal star on the side. I remember it being parked just there, actually. <laughs> so when would this have been? We can, if this we can is place great. It? This is reminiscent. I, well, it is. I mean, I, I have to this explain. This is 1960s, 1969 or 70. And so you had long hair and you a could, BW you van. You could triple park in Bedford Square. Right. And you could smoke inside here. But anyway, that's another issue. But you can still in Mark's office. Can we? Should we move to Mark's <laughs> office? But anyway, not to worry. But I, I want to say that I remember very well talking to you, or you talking to me, and I think that trip that you made around Europe, which is beautifully described in the book, I mean, I do hate nostalgia. It's my least favorite uh, emotion, I have to say. On the other hand, I actually rather indulge in it in, in, your, in your book, and it will a lot back. But you know, I remember you talking to me about... Um, various cathedrals, French cathedrals that you, you... And it's stuck with you all this time, hasn't it? And, and then you had to ask the question, what, and, and about the experience of glaciers in Switzerland and blah, 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 blah. So I think that trip was very formative in your life. And I don't think you've changed. Well, some of us progress and some of us don't. <laughs> no, but the... But the, the, fo the footings of the building, or the footings of you, were laid down in that yeah, time. Yeah, maybe they were. It was, it was a terrific freedom event, travelling around Europe in the minivan, looking at these things. And I think the, the, the cathedrals are, j are so impressive because of, the, uh, because of the way they were built. And I've often thought that if we were still building cathedrals, I would still be an architect. That's interesting. Hmm? There'd be, no, be that's, that's, something to go for. Mm, that's interesting. Isn't it? 
So you worked for Cedric, and you worked for James Gowan. Yeah, that's right. Perhaps you can parallel those two experiences a little bit. Well, well I think that's probably when we started to go our separate ways. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I could never. I mean, James Gowan was a was a was a wonderful man, interesting man, and passionate about what he did. But I could never understand why you liked him so much. Well, he was he was he was very brainy and he was very open. He was able to take things at face value that I hadn't really found because I was I was. It's not quite true that I got I left architecture after having left school. I left architecture while I was at school, mm -hmm. and I started designing projects that couldn't be built, and which were really written projects. And Can I ask? Couldn't be built. Technically, it couldn't be built financially, or what was the... Well, those two reasons were due to start it. with, yeah. But I think, uh, technically, one of them in particular was just an impossible building, but it was beautiful, I thought. And I showed it to James, who was... He was a deeply technical architect. He taught me about drains, James about how marvellous they are and about, and about how setting up the drains on the site gives you the contours of the site upon which your building sits, etc. Mm. I'd never found drains thrilling before. He described it to me and I had to work on them. Oh, it's happened. I told you it was going to happen. I can't remember what I'm going to say next. What were we you talking, talking about? about James? Technical. And I showed him the drawing of this impossible building. This is the jumbo jet drawing. And uh, he just took it. He didn't, he didn't flinch. He just said, oh, well, I, I think you just need to move these ones in the middle a bit this way and the angle will work out better. And uh, it wasn't that I was grateful because I just enjoyed him liking the drawing as much as I did, but it was, it was the way he was just able to take things completely at face value and react to them. Mm. And he was, he was just embarking on a difficult phase of his career, which he was started to be reviled for, his sort of uh, decorative phase. And he was tiptoeing into the decorative waters. And we did a, we did a warehouse down in Bermondsey, which had, um, it was red brick, and it had yellow brick. And this brick company made red and yellow bricks exactly the same, but one was red and one was yellow. And there was a stripe of yellow brick across this thing. And this is before Dmitry Porfiros bought striped architecture back, you know. This was, this was way back. It was pre-postmodern. And there was this stripe of yellow brick which was completely flush with the red brick. Mm -hmm. And James, being completely in re unreconstructed, said, it's like, it's like a, a bikini tan line on the building. Well, that's nice. And I knew exactly what he meant. And you do too. <laughs> Well, it's, it's that, that. I find that in your, in your writing, actually, the sort of laying bare without, without the literary kind of um, pretensions, let's say, of lots of architectural discourse that we find. Yeah, that line about the bikini line in tan needs... It has to carry out an apologetic rider, though, doesn't it? Why is that? Because it's a sexist remark. There's nothing wrong with bikinis. That's such okay, a thing. So, okay, so we're, one day we're hauling a table up from the basement. We, the office was on the first floor. And they lived upstairs and they lived downstairs. And the kitchen was in the basement. And his wife, Peggy, was down there most of the time. And we got, I got drafted in to haul this table up from the basement. And it was a difficult job getting this table around the stairs. And we were, we were like, tape measures and trying to get it right, trying to get it right. And... Peggy turned up and said, I think if you do this, and James said, if we, I should think two men have got quite enough to do carrying a table up the stairs without a lady female offering advice. <laughs> okay. That's way worse than the bikini line. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Well, that's the context that I saw the bikini line in. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, um, can I ask before I go back to, back to Will's opinion, what did you think of Cedric? Because you said you diverged, so well, I just wanted to dig into that. Not because of that. Not because of that, but... No, it's just, it's just interesting, because James was this, this very thoughtful aesthete. He was, he was all about aesthetics. And Cedric strung me as being all about process, and there, were, there was a different way of doing things. And um, Cedric was terrifyingly erudite and just plain terrifying, because you never knew what he was going to say. And uh, he used to give lectures 
about things that had just occurred to him that week. And he'd stand up at this lectern here with his brandy bottle and work through it. And he'd go, old age, changes in level, when he was talking about architecture. And you just, I, I could only just understand what he was talking about. And I'd go home and sleep on it and thinking that's what he was talking about. And he was, he was just profoundly brilliant in the way he thought. Mm. What was your question again? Just what you thought of him. Yeah, because I was going to. But ask. but I I was frightened of him, and I found him I found him difficult to engage with. Hmm. Well, I was going to ask what what attracted you to work with Cedric, or how did that come about? Well, he was a he, he was a, I, when I think when we were both students here, hmm. he didn't actually frequent this building very much. A little from time to time, come into the odd crit and things like that. But um, he was a sort of hero. And I was in Rome um, for a year before I left here. And I thought, I'd like to work for him. So I sent him a letter. And he said, OK. Handwritten letter, of course, way before emails. But and I, he, once you were there, he was not frightening. Incomprehensible, very often. But then you know, I spent um, what, three and a half years working for Cedric. And he would come down towards the end, often towards the end of the day and often after lunch. And he'd hang on this crossbar and talk to us. There were not many of us. And um, He'd hang on a crossbar? Yeah, okay. Well, he'd just resting backwards and forwards to hold himself up. Oh, I see. <laughs> and um, I'd listen to this stuff. I didn't... Sometimes you'd understand it and sometimes you had not a clue, coming back to your point, mm. really. And then I used to go home and try and... I thought the only way of trying to work it out is to try and work on something which is the precise opposite of what I understood. <laughs> that was good for me. So it was like... I always thought working at Cedric was like a second course in, uh, in architecture. Right. But it was self-taught. But I'm um, being, uh, being students here, because we were more or less concurrent, um, it, it was just a continuation of the same thing, because no-one taught you much here. But yet, you did learn quite a lot. But not things like drainage and <laughs> other things. And I don't think that's changed at all today. You know, when, when I have students coming in for an interview, and, uh -huh. I mean, you don't even bother to think about it. And you think, OK. But I think what has changed quite a lot is that a 30-year-old student, um, a 30-year-old person today, is like a 20-year-old. 40 or 50 years ago. A 30-year-old today is like 20-year-old 40 yeah. or 50 years ago. So we've kind of regret, so I can feel 23, that's great. But why, what do you mean oh, about... Oh, you're telling me you're 33. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? In what way? Well, they are less confident, um, they're more reliant on other people. But that's okay, I don't mind that, because they, they can learn things in, in different ways. And you find that... And when I tell them this, they say, oh, that's, that's terrible, you know. I'd like to have my own practice at the age of 30. And you say, well, fuck off. You, you won't. <laughs> Don't be silly. <laughs> but, you know, maybe by the time you're 50, you might. Sorry if there are any hearts breaking in the audience. You can and, always pick them up on it. Look, they're all over 40. Oh, there's a few. There's oh, sorry. <laughs> I do. I beg your apology. However, the, um, the great thing which I have to remind them is that they will all live at least 10 years longer than we will. So we have time to catch up. Yeah, no, okay. you don't have to worry about it. You just <laughs> make it up at the end. And the pension won't make any difference to you, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you... Um, oh, well, that's, I don't know how to take that, both as a continuous student of architecture, but also as, as a teacher. Well, I think I do tell my students that, it, you know, you mustn't believe what I tell you, and it doesn't really matter, but... Um, well, you see, I don't, I don't know about so Paul, but easy. sitting here tonight, apart from whatever age I am, and I know what age he is. I don't feel any different to when I was 26, really, in my head. There are other things that actually sort of let you down, sadly, but that's just pure mechanical engineering on the part of God, isn't it? But everything else is, is fine. Yeah, I'm trying to think whether I agree with that. I don't think I do. I think I feel pretty differently about things. Well, it's the question I wanted to ask you. Good. What, what, let's, let's ask him a question. Let's interrogate now, I think. Which has to do with age and, 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 and definitely getting older. Is 
have you noticed that the big issues become less important and small trivial things become more important? Big issues being leaving the European Union. Could, could be. <laughs> there is there's a whole Europe section in the book that was quite heartbreaking to read, yes. I think, in light of what's happening. Yes, I know. I don't, that, one, that one stopped me and has made me... Because I, I was never interested in politics as a young man at all. I wasn't thinking so much of politics. I was thinking about things more related to architecture, actually. Okay, let's get back to buildings. And, um, and I think it's kind of interesting. I think it's more interesting to think about a bench and what you might look at sitting on it and places to sit down. You see, one of the things that really upsets me are landscape architects. <laughs> I wanted you, to come to this question. You see all of these sort of things and landscape. I, I, think it's, I like gardening and there is a difference between landscape and gardening, maybe. That's not an issue. No, my dad was a landscape architect. I like landscape architects. Oh, I, I liked your dad. I think he was very good. <laughs> he was very good at painting he birds He wasn't the only as landscape well. architect I like. I like. But I think it's a little different. You know, landscape architects want to be urban designers these days, and they're not. But what are, the, what are the big but things in the they never, thing? There's never anywhere to sit, is there? Would you... I mean, it's not, and actually, with an ageing population... <laughs> you think there would be nothing but benches sitting is quite the place. Will, would you count... Benches and laboratories. Yeah, we need more Would you count those system. things as big things? I'm, I'm thinking yes. Yeah, what no, the no I th well, I think they're big things now, but the they were trivial things? things when you were younger. Yeah, but they don't have benches because... People might sleep Benches on them. encourage a homeless population. Hmm. It's a big issue. It's the big issue. Well, That's it's, why there are no a, it's a big issue. So, go, so going back to Will's question, do you think the big things are more prominent now, speaking architecturally, or small things? Obviously well, it depends well, what I you mean by big things and I small things. I don't know how interesting it is for everybody else, but we're a long way from answering the question. No, sure. Because I don't even understand the question about what the big things and the trivial things are. Let's get thrown but in the nowhere, nowhere to sit would be one of them, I suppose. But then well, that's one. I think it's more it turns into a big issue the, the minute you start thinking about it. Where and what you have for breakfast is more important, having time for breakfast. <laughs> I don't know what to say. We were going to go back to architecture. It is architecture. Oh, it's architecture. That's the whole point. See, Will studied with, with Cedric, so... <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, I'll stick my hand up here and say that originally the, the topic for this talk, was it, rather the title for the event was What is Architecture after, after your first book. Um, at which I kind of threw my hands up and said, no, we can't start with that no, question. I what thought is that architecture? Too. It's too big. No. But we're still on, in fairly big Oh, territory. that's what we're talking about. It is a big. Yeah, because while we're on the subject, how to like everything is maintains that you can't make life better. Okay. The whole point of liking everything is to accept everything as it is, because you can't change the world for the better. You can change the world, but you can't change it for the better. You can, you can work to make it different, but you can't work to make it better. How do you That's take the that, then, the as your mission statement to make pleasure and... Rather badly. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, I, I, it depends which way you, you, you look at it. And I mean, I do... Um, most of that book is, comes from Paul's various experiences, most of it. That's right. And I think experience is everything, and I think you can create experience for other people within architecture. And that's where... I, Personally, I'm at odds with all sorts of theories about architecture, and particularly the state of, of British architecture and the attitude towards architecture, and particularly in, okay, the UK today, mm -hmm. which I think is actually not very interesting on the, on the other hand. You know, How on, would you crystallise the attitude towards architecture? It's a bit fairly big thing as well. Well, I, I mean, I don't... What this, do you mean? It's not about me, it's about Paul and his book, really. But, I mean, I, I do have a question on one of my projects at the moment from the GLA saying, if the architecture wasn't so interesting, could you have more affordable housing? You think, well, hold on, you can, we have affordable housing anyway. Mm -hmm. And are you thinking that, is that an invitation to make it really bad so you can have more affordable housing? Is that a reflection on the housing it's crisis? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, so you've got, so it, on the scales, you have I mean, interesting I don't know whether the architecture is good or not, but I mean, I quite, no, quite but like it. The I question sort of implies, we all know, we all know that social mm. housing is boring. 
That's why it looks so dreadful like that. That's why we had to stop building it and start taking it all down. We all know that it's horrible looking stuff, affordable building. This is what's in the background of the question, isn't it? Therefore, yeah. this interesting architecture can't be affordable. Mm. I and mean, it might not be. <coughs> I don't know what's affordable and what's not. I mean, affordable housing is pretty unaffordable as far as I can see. Don't you? I do think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the point of thinking about it? There must be another way. There well, I mean, that's all, all comes into what, one of the categories in your book is, is one of the sections it's called money. Money. Yes. And, um, which I thought was interesting. But money is at the root of marvellous things and not such marvellous things. And I think you know, no one ever talks about, it seems to be accepted absolutely, that contractors can make 20% profit if they can and investors can make 20% profit. That's 40% off the, top off the bottom line of anything you, you choose to build. Mm -hmm. You're left with 60% to do something half decent or whatever, which might create an experience, an interesting experience, which is where life being better. It's not just about having a roof over your head. It's about, and it's, it comes up in your book, actually, about architecture and building. And I think, I, in my head, I always said, Building is not necessarily architecture. Architecture is building plus something else, and the something mm -hmm. else is where you can debate, whatever it is. Yeah. So uh, that, that is, I'm not sure that that's an agreement with you or disagreement with you, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But I do, I do think that, you know, particularly in, in London, I see, I have one, I have two relatively new buildings next to my studio in Hackney. Hackney. And it looks like Hackney, it's like pimples. You know. You're on Viner Street, aren't you? I'm on Viner Street, Street. Yeah. which I find innately dull. And I, I, from our terrace, I look into these houses and in these apartments. People are unbelievably miserable. And I, I can understand why they're miserable. You think their houses are horrible? Yeah. That's why they're miserable. I don't think it, I think the environment in, in which you live, including the, I quite like the street actually. <laughs> Viner Street, well there's lots going on, there's a sort of, isn't there a kind of artistic community going on there? Well it is sort of hipsterville, I have to say. Yeah. Everyone was, in the street kind. has a beard, including the women. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But you find that you kind go. of fertile place one? to work? Because uh, weren't you out in Battersea before? Yeah. Uh, apparently we're allowed to interrupt you. You are, you are, you are. Please do, David. Yeah. Hurry on. God, I've been looking for one of those. Ah. <laughs> let, me, let me take that and show. Is this a sign of a misspent youth, do you think? Or what, what do you remember of it now? I thought it was interesting that they were so close to each other. Oh, you, okay, we, should, we should explain that one of the links between the lights and the lights. I think, the, I think you have to ask your questions from the floor. Do I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get back. No, it's nice to see you, David. <laughs> <laughs> but you should, we should explain that we, we, uh, we had a thing, we had a few meetings, which was originally called the Architecture Club, and then we realised, I see the Peters in the, uh, in the room, um, there was an architecture, we called it the London Architecture Club. Yes. And we made certainly two, maybe three publications. Mm -hmm. I do. I think. Yes, Paul was telling me how you had not only the London Architecture Club, but the London School of Architecture early iteration um, several decades yeah, ago. Yeah, the London School of Architecture was a bit later. That was with Bob Evans and Chris McDonald. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Will in knows. In 1986. Um, just for those of you who can't see at the uh, back of the room, there's two people sat on a bench. And the title, or above, above the image, it says client, and then it says the teetotaler's Tito cocktail cabinet will also. So, um, do you want to decipher this? What, what's going on this in, is, in these images? I'm going to. This is where we need the camera well. over the thing. But I was, you know, I was. I think I was more architectural in those days than Will. I'm not sure about what was. I did a series of drawings called The Last of the Stately Homes, which were, they were, oh, we can't see, we should have had that camera mini Is it too late? You can pass it around. We can pass it around, there's only a small crowd. Or you can come up and see. Do you mind? I don't think you brought that. 
that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Then. This brief is quite incredible. I think perhaps we should we should pass this round too. But I'm, I'm concerned that we're just having um, a kind of chat with with ourselves now. But I should explain that David. I used to. I, I was David's uh, an assistant, working with David, teaching here. Mm -hmm. Shortly after leaving here, I think. have I ever talked with you, David? Have I ever talked with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I do, th I, well, I, do, I mean, I find it very interesting that Paul, who I thought earlier on was, uh, would make a lot of headway in the world of architecture and, and do some, build some interesting things. Mm. He hasn't done that purposely. Or mm -hmm. By choice. Who knows, or by cho uh, certainly by choice, yeah, as it would appear. And, and he's gone into writing. And I would say about this, uh, about this book in particular, hold it up, mm -hmm. is that I, and it's a sort of question in a way that if you, if you weren't labeled with architect written across your forehead, which is not, it's fading, let's say, and it just appeared on the shelves, maybe with a slightly different title, I think people would buy it and enjoy it for what it is. Well, I suppose they're not buying it and not enjoying it as it is. Well, no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, you no, I shouldn't think, have said I think that. that's coming but, back to what I was saying about what I enjoy about how, Paul's writing. How, it's not sort of um, in-your-face architectural writing. It is based on experience. It is based on those You don't need to know things. that he's an architect. Right. But on the back it says he's an architect. Right. And, you know, we're sitting in an architecture school talking in part about mm -hmm. his book. Uh, I, I think... So if I said to you, Paul, you are now an author... Are you happy with that? That's what I tell people. Well, I tell people I'm a writer, and how to like everything was was a, an embarkation from the subject of architecture. It isn't. It isn't about architecture. It's about something else. And uh, it was really difficult to sell how to like everything. Really difficult to sell. And MIT had been publishing the previous books, which were all about architecture in various ways. And I'm going to tell you what they said to me, that they, they didn't think they could do it. They, it, wasn't, it wasn't quite right. It wasn't, it wasn't what they wanted to see. And I was upset by this, because I'd assumed they would publish it. And Roger Conover, the commissioning editor at MIT, said, I don't know, Paul, you want, you want my advice about what to do with this book? And I said, yeah, please. He said, stick it in a drawer, forget about it. And it was like being kicked in the stomach. It was a terrible thing to say. And for, somehow he'd, he'd assumed it was a memoir and he'd taken against memoirs. I now have unraveled this to discover this. Mm -hmm. um, but all my other books were in the first person present as well. Mm -hmm. And so what was different about how to like everything? And it was a difficult moment because it felt that I'd, it felt that I was doing this thing and everybody was appreciating it and that it was doing quite well. And I strayed off this path and uh, got nowhere with it. And so I, I retreated back to architecture for this book. Hmm. And uh, so it's interesting for me, anyway, to, to, to hear you say it could, it could be reoriented. Are you, are you saying that it just needs a different title? No, I'm not suggesting no, no, this it's book, interesting. but it could have a different title, is what I said. The title would be... Um, Read this, you'll like it. <laughs> but it would still be the same book inside. Same book, yeah. Yeah, that's no, that's interesting. Whether it's a buildings, whether it's a book about buildings or not, because when I was writing it, I was thinking I'm going to write this. You know, Gertrude Stein had that line, "Who are you writing for?" And she said, "For myself and strangers." Hmm. And I, th I asked myself who I was writing this for, because I didn't really want to go on writing for architecture students. I didn't want to go on writing for academia, really. And so I thought I'll write it for my daughter, Ruby. She lives in America. She knows nothing about architecture. I'll, write, I'll aim this one at her. And um, I, I don't think I succeeded in that. You know, the, the subject became the academicization of my own brain took over and started making me think about it slightly differently. But it lets you get there by yourself. 
Um, while we're talking about architectural writing, can I just um, yeah, turn to you and think, what's it for? Um, do you enjoy, do you read much architectural writing? I mean, let's think about less your practice and, less. and so on. Less and less. Why is that? Well, I, I mean, I can relate this back to Paul. I always remember a long time ago, uh, you were talking and you were saying, you know, one of the problems with writing about architecture is the journalists think, think they're critics and the critics think they're historians and historians think, think they're philosophers. It, yes, I remember this. It's like an inflation. I thought that was very good. And um, but it, so it has become. But, of course, the context in which you're writing has changed. And Peter Murray is sitting in, here mm. in the room. Um, who was a very important part of Architectural Design magazine. When sure. Architectural Design magazine, I can't say it's not good. I find it impenetrable sometimes today. But at that time, it was, it was really interesting. It was the sort of publication you could not wait to come through your front door. And it was good. And everyone read it. Well, everyone in our circles. You're talking about no, 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 no. Particular, blueprint, particular. blueprint was just not even thought about at that time. That's true, you were talking yeah, about Yeah, they didn't earlier. have the internet in those days, so what, so me. And so it came to, and, and it was varied, it was interesting. Some of it was fiction, that was all right. Um, but it actually about? made you think, and it published some interesting, what were interesting people to me. Okay, so that was good. And now, you know, the evolution, and partly to do with the internet, I think, amongst other things, I suppose advertising, the whole finance or economics are based around publishing. Mm. And I, I still quite like paper, I have mm -hmm. to say. Not because I'm old fashioned, it's because I'm very, I'm the new modern. We'll come back to that maybe. Say that. We'll come back to that maybe. And um, I think that um, it's become less insightful, less interesting, more interested in architecture as a business as opposed to architecture as architecture. Mm -hmm. No real criticism. Dull. Mm. I blame you. I'll take it because I'm good. not doing that anymore. Oh, but, good. Um, okay. good girl. Are you, uh, but do you think there's still a place then for architectural writing? I mean, for example, in this school, a lot of what we say to our students is, is kind of writing is a part of architectural practice. And it's I, I think... Um, and I write quite a lot. I don't mm. always publish everything. Mm -hmm. I just like to write because it is a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I like to paint because it's another way of thinking. And that's what interests me about, about Paul. And he's become more and more of a, of a writer as opposed to an author. I think that's what he said. But it doesn't matter the same thing, in my view. And you can, you can explore architecture. Although, in spite of what I said about the book, you can explore architecture through writing. This other book, which I, is my present to mm. Paul tonight, is a way of doing a master plan for a place in Spain without doing a master plan, but using words. And it, therefore, it, these are all tools that we can use. And I, th I personally, I find that interesting. Mm. It's very difficult to get across. If you're talking to, if I presented this, which I don't have to, to some committee at CABE, they, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Hmm. Sadly, and I, I think that's really, uh, and you see, I, the reason, I mean, David Green here used to teach me, and I love being taught by David, and that's why I wanted to, to teach with him, because I could learn something, because there was always, like, something else, there was this stuff called architecture, building, the built environment, how we live, social issues, and this other thing. And it was the other thing that interested me, and still, still does. So, you know, I've not built as much as Allies and Morrison, thank God. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to build, because I think you do learn from, from building stuff. Mm -hmm. But the whole context is... It? I'm doing stuff... I'm probably doing more in London than I have done ever, actually. Tell us a bit more about this narrative way of building a master plan. I'm trying to find um, sort of well, connections you, between you. Sometimes you can, you can write things, you can describe things which you can't draw. And I still draw, like, every day. Um, and that seems to me that dialogue between drawing and words and using words when I can't draw it or vice versa mm -hmm. um, is useful. You can create some sort of ambience around a place, a thing, an idea, 
uh, an object. And I think that's, and I think the celebration of the moment. I've, I've just done a, a truffle cutter for a lessee. Could there be a more pleasurable object? No, none whatsoever. <laughs> Truffles are beautiful. But the act of, because you know, they're very expensive, and they're kind of shaving off just the right amount to go on to this. Mm. I feel I quite hungry. We might have lost Will for, for a few moments. <laughs> can, I, I wouldn't mind another, can I have another glass of water? Thank you. Um, can I ask you, Paul, do you think about putting a book together as a structural exercise? I do in my writing, so I'm kind of just um, doing research now as to how you work. We're changing the subject, aren't we? Well, from... Writing as building to almost building as writing. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I, I figured that writing is really about people. This one has a very clear structure, doesn't it? it has a sort yeah, of... sorry, I'll answer your question. I will answer your <laughs> question. I, but I think, I think what I figured out was that writing was about people, which is why my books are so full of people saying things. And with this book, I, I was trying to write about the buildings as characters. I was trying to animate the buildings and, and use them as characters. It's most obvious in the totem pole chapter because they, they actually look like people, but um, there's a way of describing it like that. And, and the, the building up of the... What appeals to me about writing, why, why I think one of the things that's so difficult about writing is that architecture is a, is a, a dumb activity. You can, you can do it by gesture and grunt, you see what I mean? Whereas writing, you're, you're comparing things all the time. So you ask a question about something, what's it like, you say? What's, what's, that, what's that building like? And immediately you're into the metaphor of comparing it to other things and you're into the skill of writing just mm -hmm. by, by trying to describe what you're doing and uh, I do like oh, Jesus well I'm not drinking I'm on antibiotics and um, <laughs> I find the combination marvelous yes I know <laughs> but ap apparently um, it does something to the spirit and affects the blood um, that was diverting but yes, yes. The, the, the structure is structure is structure is structure is structure. I remember at a party when I was a student meeting a playwright at a party. What do you do? I write plays. Oh, I, write, I design buildings. And the, the conversation became really interesting when I discovered that, that structurally the issues were known to us both. You know, mm. they, they weren't the same, but they were similar. They were comparable. And um, so, yeah, I structure my books. I structure my books a lot. I, you know where you're going with them, don't you? Unlike my writing, oftentimes I'll just try and spout, but, but you kind of plan yours out. Yeah, I, I remember talking to Ellis Woodman about the um, difference between journalism and writing and about how when you're writing a piece about something, you've got, you're, you know, we want 2,000 words and we're all sorts of building. Can you do that? You just have to dive into it, and you you dive into it, and you write something, and and it's like an electrical process. You you grow or coral growing. You grow the thing off what you've just written, and mm -hmm. you come to the two thousand words, and you've done it like mm -hmm. that. Whereas embarking on a on a project like this doesn't feel like that. It feels much more uh, like gathering in the sheaves. You know, I'm starting on another book now. You're incredible. I can't believe you're so prolific. You just keep writing. And, you know... No, I've only written five books. Some well, people write it's... a book a year. Well, so you're writing. What's the new one about? The new one, I think, is about old age, because you know, <laughs> this is what I'm surrounded by. And I've been told, uh, you, have a, you have a whole audience of baby boomers all turning 70 at the same time right now, so you're writing for them, yeah? They've all experiencing the same problems you are, so you're writing for them which I thought was a pretty positive way. She said she had said to me, what are you writing about? We must talk. And uh, I told her, oh, 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 and I'm surrounded by old age. And she came up with this great idea. So I've taken this as being a great idea, and I'm starting to try and write about it. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I'm, I've started by writing paragraphs about this and that. I had a knee operation, which was a profoundly affecting thing, and I was on the seventh floor of the Royal Free with London spread out. Right, I could see the entire horizon of London from this, from my bedroom window, and it was. I had it done on November the first, so on November fifth, this entire horizon was lit up by fireworks. It was just oh, beautiful. So I started writing about this phenomenon, and um, eventually that will make its way into the book, but it's still loose. It's still a pack of cards being constructed, waiting for structure to mm. happen to it. Mm. But um, the, the, way, the way I do it anyway is to gather these together, start having thoughts about it like this, and to uh, aim to make a contents list. Mm. And when I've got a contents list, I have something to work with. Right. I mean, as a, as a non-designer, as a writer, I'm, I'm kind of fancifully comparing your almost blank page phenomenon to you receiving 350 hectares and do what you want with it kind of, kind of project. But well, I don't know well, if that was the case. It's not quite the sort of a I'm comparison describing, I'd make. But I'm describing this, this project in Spain, which Will mentioned briefly. But, but I, do th I do think there are similarities. Um, in some ways, is that well, actually, when we when we started here, there was a, a man called Tony Dugdale that used to teach here, and there was a whole that they were very there was a whole load of people here who were influenced by Karl Popper, which was translated into the idea of architecture being problem solving, which always gave me a, a problem. Actually, I thought, well, if you're waiting for the problem, it's too late mm -hmm. in some ways. And then anyway, it must be involved with something else. And pl pleasure certainly was in my mind, consciously or not. And that, you know, the, the delights of things that we experience. And I still maintain that Paul's book is very much about his experience, which is a very earthy experience, I mm -hmm. think, which I, quite, I like. Earthy. Earthy. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you've got gravity, <laughs> geology. No, earthy is fine. Earth. I just wasn't sure I'd heard and, that. Um, but I think there is a moment when you're messing around, searching for something, you know, which is, is better. It's better not being in the studio, really, I think. You know, I'm very fond of the kitchen table and, mm. and messing around, usually late at night. And then you might find something. It's like fishing, in a way. You keep going and you keep going. And then you, you recognize it. You might not be able to describe it, but there is a feeling, which is a wonderful feeling, where you can see a way forward on something. It doesn't always happen. And it's a very difficult thing to describe, but it does happen if you're lucky. And if you're looking for it, that's the, the key is issue. You've got to be patient, and you've got to give it time. Well, I think... Um other things that happen around the kitchen table are our conversations, obviously. So, yeah, no, no, let me, it's better let me... when they've all gone to bed. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's Can I just ask question. a quick question? Because it's just been on my mind, the notion of legacy. What do you two think lasts longer, a book or a building? Paul. Well, I've got, I've got a sentence in that book there somewhere about... I can't remember quite the conclusion that I came to, but a, it's, it's a commonplace thing that the thought lasts longer than the building. That's right, it's in talking about Basho. The, oh, that's right, yeah. Basho, the, the haiku poet of Japan who traveled around Japan in the 17th century writing about really interesting buildings that he found on the way, and they were all oh, just fabulous things. Like the one I'm talking about in there is the... Um, poison stone which is surrounded by a carpet of dead butterflies and insects and it's still there this stone and it was said to be the uh, spirit carcass of the nine-tailed fox woman and he wrote about all this and uh, the, that, that stone is still there it's, it, the explanation is it stands on a, a volcanic vent, which is sulfurous, and that's what kills the insects. But um, most of the stuff he'd written about has disappeared mm -hmm. because of 
the tendency of the world to erode things back to a flat surface. There is such a tendency, isn't there? It's called uniformitarianism. <laughs> so, and um, so he, he, literally his, his book has lasted longer than the things he wrote about. But uh, I don't think it's that, that clean that ideas last longer than bricks and mortar because um, I always come back to the Great Pyramid in El Giza, which is, um, it's apparently indestructible. And I think maybe you could drop a nuclear weapon on it and it would still be there. I don't know. Could you knock it down with a well, thermal it, it, blast? Give some ideas. But it's, well, it's, it's part of the idea that it might last a long time. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. It, it's, but it, it's an enormous great tetrahedron of masonry. And inside there's this tiny little gilded chamber with the sarcophagus of the, of the pharaoh in it right buried deep in this enormous stone mass and it's sustained very hot it's it? survived very hot in there when you climb up it you can't stand up and you go up the staircase and you arrive in this chamber which is smaller than this room by quite a long way yeah then you had to go down again yeah. it's unbelievable well, if you're meant to be in there, you're not going yes, anywhere, you're not, really. You're not meant to be. Oh, I, I, I wasn't worried about Pharaoh, I was worried about me. But Will, are you concerned at all with legacy in terms of your buildings? Are you concerned if, you know, if or when they get Not particularly. Eroded? I mean, I, th I, th I think my very best building is already gone, actually. I mean, it's, do I regret that? I don't know. Um, no, not, not, not a lot. You know, I do worry about... Some people come around and say, oh... I think we're going to list Peckham Library. I hope you don't, because I don't think it's going to last that long. <laughs> anyway, and then, you, then you'll get blamed because they have to spend quite a That's lot of money. That's a good point, there. actually. Buildings aren't really specced to but, last no, they're forever. Not. And, you know, the budget. Society decides how much they want to spend on their buildings. I imagine the, the, the Great Pyramid at Giza costs rather a lot in those days. And, well, it um, was built by slaves, I think, so maybe... Well, not so much. It cuts the cost down a bit. Patience. They, they had to be patient, didn't they? But I... I and, and then I suppose poor old architects respond mm. to whatever society wants to, wants to build. You know, but the li listing is an interesting thing. I'm, this isn't really about legacy, is it? But listing is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because it distorts the... It distorts what you'd think would be the ordinary run of events where the thing, when it's no longer any use to anybody, it can be taken down and put back up again. Well, it it's, can I can go be. into it a bit in the subject on money. That's right. But yes, I, I was watching a program about Galapagos the other day, the Galapagos Islands, you know, which is the famous test bed for evolutionary theory, and there's a bunch of, bot of um, zoologists up there, and they... If, it followed these guys as they tracked down the pink iguana, which is only found on Galapagos, and only on tiny parts of Galapagos, and is, is endangered. It's, the species is not surviving. So what they were doing was they were going out and they were capturing these pink iguanas and moving them to a different part of the island in order that they might colonize other parts of the island so that they wouldn't become extinct. Right. And... I thought they'd missed, they'd missed Darwin's point completely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, extinction is, is one of the prime mechanisms for evolution, and here they are trying to keep things the way they are for the sake of legacy. I love that you got there through listing. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> right. It's yeah, absolutely I, can, I, can, I can understand that mm -hmm. completely. Although I, I have to say, I do find myself... Well, I, my, my, my studio in, in China is in Chongqing. <laughs> my wife never, when I, when I say to my wife, up? I'm going to Chongqing. I got a studio in China. She thinks I must have a lover in China. And Chongqing doesn't really exist, but it does. And it's 32 million people. And it's a big place. And I like being there mm -hmm. more and more. Anyway, there are two ladies from the local government who are younger than me. And they're responsible, in part, for the planning. And they, they want to knock this, this, this series of factories down where they used to print all the money in China was printed in these buildings. 
yeah, and they're they're built like like you couldn't uh, you could knock them down, but they're very very strong, flawless, uh, big machines going. I said, why would you do that? You've knocked everything else down virtually. Mm -hmm. And there are some things, and I, I, th I think this is right that that to leave something, I mean, you could you could distort them, you could add to them, you could do everything else, but these are part of a sort of narrative of the city, which they removed. There are people's memories, um, and, and you can change the memories, but not to eradicate them. Mm. That, that's my view. I find myself thinking that more and more, and therefore things could last, but they need to be adjusted and responded. Well, they need to be... It's a form of evolution, really. Well, I, I think it's, it's not quite a form of evolution, because they need to be sustained. If you, if you want something to stay there, you have to look after it and sustain it. I remember mm. Cedric, since we were talking about him, talking about Canterbury Cathedral, in front of a room full of people, Canterbury Cathedral, and what use is it? Nobody, nobody uses, nobody believes in that anymore. We should knock it down, it's occupying prime. Do you remember him saying this, David? We should knock it down and build social housing. And he was being iconoclastic, you know, like obviously. Patrick Schumacher and <laughs> yes, Park, right. it? <laughs> he was um, he was being iconoclastic, but the point was that we're not going to knock Canterbury Cathedral down because it's so great. We all love it, and we're going to keep it there because we all love it. So it's not use value, but it's another kind of value. But that's yeah. that's what sustainability means. Right. It, it isn't, I agree with that. Whereas totally. the the pyramid is just surviving no matter what. <coughs> and I think there's a difference between sustainability and survivability, which I go into here. And I'm, I'm very interested in it because this is how I had to leave Texas, was getting stuck with this. Sustainability. Uh, sustainability. Well, on this moment of accord, I'm going to bring in one more question. And then, are there any other questions? Maybe we can take two or three? No, okay. Well, can well uh, th this is a response to what I picked up from your website. Um, My website? Yeah. Uh, and also the one book of yours. Um, that I've got what is architecture. Um, I got the sense that you're working across uh, certain, uh, a certain, fe certain fields, and these were uh, characterized by uh, tensions. One was the sense mm. of um, the span between geology as a natural foundation and the built stuff that is. Uh, organized on top and across it. The second was the span between permanence, especially something like the pyramids, and technolog technological ephemera, like the airplanes that are flying above it. Um, another one was between uh, vernacular and high design. Um, and uh, 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 a further one was perhaps the experience of individuals in amid all these systems, because you have a section on your website called, I think it's called Hackney Voices, and they're just yeah. individual people that you describe uh, living in that place. So the, there are the four themes that I've, I, I sensed in your writing. Is that fair, do you think? Do you, do you think of them as themes that you transverse or transverse? Well, no, I think it's fantastic to have somebody re read a book and interpret it in this general way. I, I thought What is Architecture was the book I wrote in a, in a blurt at teaching in at Kingston and trying to get it clear and trying to make it clear that it wasn't, that literary theory wasn't going to be able to describe it because it was something else. Mm -hmm. And what else it was was quite important to establish. And mm -hmm. so it was about uh, material, I called it the art of the land in that book. But you're, you're right that the, some, some of those things are resurfacing yes. elsewhere in, in this book and in the other things I've written. Indeed, in the title, I think um, you just mentioned this tension between buildings and, and kind of landscape. And of course, the subtitle of the book is Between Living Time and Rocky Space. And I found that too, actually. Coming back to the slightly, can I say scornful, um, notion towards landscape architecture, <laughs> it's something that I was going to ask you, um, where landscape and actual geology and the, the material of land seems to feature really prominently in how you talk about architecture. And again, like money, I find that that's a topic that we're somewhat 
hands off about at school? At school? I when I say I mean. at school, I mean here and, and also, I think we've, let, we've learnt to deal with words like context and so on, but landscape is still a little bit... Yeah, well, context is one of those literary theory words, isn't it? Mm. it it's one. It talk, context is about how the meaning changes when you place a word next to another mm -hmm. word. And the, the material world isn't like that. One thing stands next to another, and the only way to give, to give them a relationship is to, is to contextualize them, to make it up, to write about what the relationship it is. Because the, the pyramid and the jet don't have anything to do with each other. Right. They're separate things. Right. But look at them together. You can, you can make a meaning out of it by putting them into context. This is what writers do. They put things into context. But you're not so much doing that. You, I mean, you have this duality well, no, that I'm you Well, no, I'm trying mentioned. to... That's right. The difficulty always is trying to write without using literary shortcuts. I try not to do contextual things uh, by mistake, as it were. Mm. I mean, I guess I'm asking more generally, is this sort of um, attitude towards landscape particularly within architectural writing, is it something you perceive and you're acting on deliberately, or is it just how you experience and see? Well, it came out of that, that thought that, that landscape is the ground and the buildings stand on it and the machines move around it. Mm. And there were different time scales, different times involved in these things. The machines, machines survive by having a very short life and being very closely tailored to what they do. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very specifically about doing what they do, whereas buildings are looser fit and last a bit longer. Maybe this is part of the legacy thing. Mm -hmm. And the landscape is a, is, is, is a very long-term thing. And the, the landscape book is about landscapes which have come, come they, they come about through some kind of activity or crisis or a war or some, some significant event makes the landscape for the building to stand in. Right. And you can't just go about, maybe I've got this against landscape architects too, you can't arrive at a virgin site and turn it into something just like that. You no know, some such thing as a virgin site, is there? Is there? Sorry? There's, I was saying there's no such thing as a virgin site, is there? Well, there's not much of it left. It is difficult in this country anyway. Mm. But, I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't f create the event is what I'm going to say. The event has to be meaningful in order for the landscape to count. But I think my, my, part of my objection, and I think that's part of it, but is landscape design mm. has become a style. And that, that, I think that's a big problem. Okay. I think, um, well, let's see. There, there's a question at the back. I don't know if it's about landscape design, but let's invite it anyway. Um, hey, Douglas. Hi. 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 Um, I would like to ask the panel, uh, in their opinion, uh, who has come the closest in history to combining a great architecture practice with a great writing practice? A great what practice? A great architectural practice with a great writing practice. He's good at both. I mean, I can certainly think of people who are better at one than another, but... <laughs> oh, God, I can't think of any... I, mean, I can't think Le, of anyone. Uh, Le Corbusier springs to mind. Is that, does good that painter. Work? <laughs> maybe, maybe people who can do everything would do be good architects and writers Michael as well. Ma Michelangelo, it could be a group discussion. Well, can you think of any any? No, well, uh, d d d do you have someone in mind? I'm, I'm, not, sure. Sure. I'm not sure it's ever been done. Ah, is your question more like, do you have to be one or the other? Can you be both? Well, that might be a subtext. All right. Okay. Was Rainer Bannerm an architect? I'm not well, sure. I was thinking that too, but I don't. I can't think of anything he built, but Douglas, uh, and I don't think so. Douglas, you, you struggle with this duality yourself, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you cheeky. <laughs> and it, I think, I think, from my experience, marching into teaching is quite a dangerous thing to do. I think it invites you to say goodbye to the world of architecture and writing. No. It, uh, is waiting for people to write. Writers are, they really go well with, with education because well, education is sitting around talking about things. Mm. Okay. 
Um, so we, we've concluded that we can't really think of anyone. Is that right? I thought Le Corbusier was quite Corbusier a good pitch, is, okay. Because the writing is, isn't it? The writing is polemic and deliberate. Masses in light. Airplane. Our age Sorry, is what's defining that? Alan Cullen. Alan Cullen. Yeah. But what building is it Alan Cullen? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, well, we won't go to the Americas, things will get too complicated. Are there, are there any more questions or, or just bits that you want to throw into this kitchen table discussion? Because we can carry on. Do you have more for, for Paul? I want a cigarette. <laughs> Paul, do you have any questions for Will before we let him go for a cigarette? Yes, how are you going to have a cigarette in a no smoking building? <laughs> By, by going on to the front door, so. Well, let's see if we... Do we have some more time, or shall we, shall we kind of call time on this? Well, I, I think oh, it's, I'm it's coming to, to a natural end, but I could sit here all evening. I think it's really interesting doing this. Well, I, I guess... The Hackney Voices... Can I just tell Brian tell stories, about the yeah. Hackney Voices? This was a, a, um, a community regeneration project which employed artists, and I was employed as a writer artist to work with 10-year-olds in a school. And there were two, in two schools, and one of them the, had a temporary headmaster and was all over the place. And the other was a school which was very well run with a headmaster who really knew what she was doing. And everything was all right. And these Ten-year-old kids were having a really good education at this school, and these ten-year-old kids were having a really bad education at this school. And I was given the job of talking to these ten-year-old kids about the regeneration in Hackney. And there was no difference between them. When you got them out of school, there was no difference between them at all. They were just all these ten-year-old kids. It was, and they, it, it was a fantastic age where you, you start realising how the world is made up, and you start thinking about your part in it and you haven't yet hit the barriers that are going to hit you down the line, which with these children was quite remarkable. You know, they were going to get racial barriers, they were going to get poverty barriers, mm -hmm. they were going to get, um, get into trouble, and this was all going to happen when they were 14, 15, and suddenly the shit was going to hit the fan and their lives were going to become like you'd expect, but they hadn't got there yet, and it was just beautiful to, to work with them, to walk around with them, just listening to what they were saying. And I summarized what they were saying in that series of poems. Can you, can you, can I give you any no, point to that story? No, I was going to ask you if you can kind of uh, spout a poem, but I'm not sure that's a bit too mean to ask you to do. No, I can't remember them. Was that something you were asked to do, or something that you were doing as part of the research? For well, I was asked to do some. I was like asked that. to do something that came out of this thing. So that's what I did. It was the response. It was the artist's response. Well, look, as as um, we are kind of drawing to a close, I'm going to be a bit cheeky. Um, Why are we drawing to a close? Well, I think we should. I think it's, yeah. it's getting dark, and people should go and have dinner and things. But um, I was going to ask you because people always ask people from um, older generations. For, for her, for direction, for something, for something like that. So as an architectural writer who's managed to produce really beautiful books and make a, make a living off of that, um, I mean, how do you feel about what you do uh, as a kind of continuing profession? Do you feel a bit like this is possible now or, or that you're the last of a generation that's been able to do this? Oh, oh that was, I wasn't expecting that rider to the question. No, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure every generation can do this. It just depends how you do it. And the, the living doesn't come out of the writing. It comes out of the teaching jobs that come out of the writing, if you see what I mean. Mm. Having a solo authored book is, counts as a PhD in an American university. It's, it's, it gets you a job. I guess I was thinking more that thinking and talking about architecture is still a, a sustainable and viable practice to do. Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't know, because somehow I've written it out. Mm. You know, by writing the buildings book, I've written architecture out of my life. It's one of the things you do. When I was scared of dogs, I wrote about dogs, and I stopped being scared of dogs kind of thing. 
and I hear they're using writing therapy to get people past traumas now. Mm. And it is true, when you write about something, it does leave your life. Do you feel that way about projects, Will? Do you, do you, are they kind of things that you're working through and then they're gone? Surely not. No, because projects aren't the same as written works. You have projects, but it's not the main point, I don't think. And, um, it's about being an architect. Is that a sustainable profession anymore? You well, see people in your, you know, new young people. You might people be threatened in, in all, all sorts of ways, but that opens up another conversation, which is not for now, really. Uh, I think you, uh, my definition of, of being an architect, and I don't always think of myself as an architect, I, mean, I do other things which I, I enjoy, but to me it's all the same thing, really. Hmm. I wish I was a musician, really, but I mean, that's not going to be. But I think. It's, a, it's about, I already said it, it's about this search for something else. And it's the something else which is always a curiosity. Mm. And I'm not sure what it is, and I'm not sure that I want to know what it is, but you, because the whole point is that you spend time worrying about that you don't know what it is, and therefore looking for it. And if you found it, that would be the end of it, wouldn't it? You die. Yeah, I'm going to add a rider to that because you asked me about how the books are structured. Mm -hmm. This is a very belated answer which has got something to do with what you just said, which is that uh, the, what is architecture was this kind of baby in the pram yelling trajectory that out of which came the landscape book, out of which came the machines this book. This is great because now Out of which this came and the I'll How to, to Like Everything list. book. And <laughs> so everything leads on to everything else. Mm -hmm. And the, the living time and rocky space has led on to this issue of, of being alive. I think you're maybe talking the book about old age being alive. And I'm thinking also talking, I thought I'd call it talking about my generation. Mm -hmm. You know that song? Because it's about the baby boomers. Talk about my generation. Then in brackets, underneath it says, hope I die before I get old. <laughs> but it's written by somebody who has not achieved that ambition. All right, well, on that note of, um, of thinking about life and other things, I mean, I just think it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both not about, you know, um, your latest project, for example, or anything tremendously practical. I think the conversation has been about other things, and we've kind of thanks to Manny J and the AA for allowing us the space to do that, and for, uh, to all of you for taking the time to allow us to talk about other things and trace these kind of fringy reasons which are actually the reasons why we do what we do so thanks very much and if you could thank my two panelists that'd be great But I don't think we did. We were touch on it.